come on to what the climate extremist movement would call global warming's evil twin, ocean acidification. Now, one of the things that Professor Abraham repeatedly does in his presentation is to take a remark that I make, wrench it out of its context, not tell his listeners what the context was, and then invent a fictitious version of what I said, and then attack the fictitious version, and then go to other authors to get them to attack the fictitious version as well. And then he makes a comment on their attack, again, attacking me. Deeply unprofessional, but that's what he does time and again. And here's an example. In passing, at one point in my presentation, which after all was before 1,200 ordinary people, and that means you occasionally have to lighten the load a little bit, because there's quite a lot of heavy science in all this. I said, right, the thing is, last week they called it global warming. And then global warming stopped. And there hasn't been any since the mid-1990s. Then they called it climate change, until everyone started noticing that the climate really isn't changing any more unusually than it's changed before. So then they're now trying to call it energy security, in the waxman Markey bill that's before Congress at the moment. And I said, next week, no doubt, they'll be calling it ocean acidification, and it's only eventually that everyone admit that the whole scare is absolute rubbish. So what Professor Abraham does is to take this out of context, pick out ocean acidification on its own, say that I said ocean acidification is absolute rubbish, and then attack me for that. So, now I've given you the context, which of course is far more innocuous than the way he puts it. Let's just have a look at ocean acidification. And the way he approaches it, he says, we're going to look at what some of the experts say. And note the use of the word some, because he means what he says there. Some of the experts say. And he says the ocean uh, acidification issue is that carbon dioxide has been dissolved in the ocean, making carbonic acid, and that makes it difficult for animals who want to grow calcium carbonate shells. Ocean acidification is a big, big worry in the scientific community. This is something the media hasn't picked up on and the general public hasn't picked up on, but this is a big, big problem because if the ocean becomes too acidic, we're going to destroy the ability of carbonate shell life forms to survive. This is a big deal. Right. Well, pass out the handkerchiefs and violins. That sounds pretty blood-curdling, doesn't it? Well, Here's what the professor does. He quotes numerous scientific papers, and what is, as always, so interesting about these papers is that they're all, so many of them are speculative. They're saying, well, under conditions, here's one, Hugh Goldberg, et al., 2007, under conditions expected in the 21st century, global warming and ocean acidification will compromise carbonate accretion, with corals becoming increasingly rare on reef systems. Now, these are the very same corals that have existed. In the case of the calcite corals, since the Cambrian era, 550 million years ago, and in the case of the more delicate aragonite corals, since the Jurassic era, 175 million years ago. And suddenly, we put a tiny pinch of extra CO2 in the atmosphere, and they all coil over and die. I don't think so. Let's just have a look at a few of the facts here, shall we? In the Cambrian era, 550 million years ago, you're all too young, but I remember it well. At that time, there was 20 times as much carbon dioxide in the oceans as there is today. 20 times. 20 times as much in the atmosphere, and broadly speaking, 20 times as much in the oceans. It doesn't always work out exactly like that. Henry's law is quite complicated, but certainly 20 times as much in the atmosphere as there is today. And yet that was when these corals first achieved algal symbiosis and came into being. And in the, in the Jurassic era, 175 million years ago, 15 times as much CO2 in the atmosphere as there is today. And that's when 
the aragonite corals came into existence, when there was far more CO2, I mean hugely more, 15 to 20 times more CO2 in the atmosphere, that's when these corals first came into existence. And we're suddenly saying that a tiny increase in the partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere is possibly going to have these enormous effects. Well, hey, I'm not sure that that's at all likely. But let's check, and being a mathematician, I like to check things quantitatively, and of course, not being an oceanographer, not being an ocean chemist, I'm going to put a big qualifier on what I say now, because I haven't finished checking this with the chemistry professor who is helping me to understand this problem. But broadly speaking, as I understand things at the moment, this is how it comes out, with that qualification. There is at the moment 70 times as much CO2 in the oceans as there is in the air, 70 times as much. If we add CO2 to the existing atmosphere, about a third of what we add goes into trees and plants, a third of what we add will stay in the air, and a third of what we add will end up in the oceans. In fact, 30% is the fraction which we think ends up in the oceans. These are all rough figures. I'm just giving you an idea. What ballpark are we in here? So if we double the CO2 in the atmosphere, as we may over the next century, if we don't worry about carbon mitigation, and as you realize by now, I don't worry about carbon mitigation, we don't have to worry about how much carbon we emit. If we don't make any restraint on carbon emissions, then we will double the CO2 in the atmosphere by some time later this century, so the IPCC predicts. So that will mean that one third, call it 30%, of all the CO2 that's now in the atmosphere will uh, be added to the oceans. So 30% of 1 70th of what's already in the oceans will end up in the ocean. Now 30% of 1 70th is, let's do it, it's 0.428571%. 0.428571%. That's all. And 0.4% extra CO2 in the oceans isn't going to make that much difference. In fact, I don't know of any scientific paper that has ever tried adding just an extra 0.4% CO2 to the oceans to see whether it makes any difference, because they know perfectly well it won't. What they do is often try to bubble very much larger quantities of CO2 into the air. But you can't do that. There's so much already in the oceans that we, even if we burnt all the fossil fuels there are, could hardly change the amount of CO2 in the oceans. It just wouldn't really register. So this whole <coughs> ocean acidification problem is based, I think, on the fallacy that adding a tiny bit to the atmosphere will somehow cause an enormous extra percentage to end up in the ocean. And that simply is, I think, against the laws of physics. Though I am still checking this one out, but broadly speaking, I don't think you could push it beyond increasing the CO2 in the oceans by, shall we say, a generous 10%. And that would, of course, greatly increase the number of um, hydrogen ions and therefore um, it would reduce the pH and, and move the oceans a little bit towards neutrality. There's no way we're going to be able to make the oceans become acidic. And the fact that the professor here uses the word acidic of the oceans shows that he really doesn't understand elementary ocean chemistry. I mean, it's quite clear that with an ocean pH of 8, which is what it is now, and 7 is neutral, Eight is strongly alkaline, and rainwater, which is 5.4, that's actually quite strongly acid. Now, there's no way we can get it anywhere near like rainwater. There's no way we can even get it to neutrality at seven. That's not going to happen. Why? Well, I consulted Professor uh, Ian Plymer, who's an expert in geology, and he said, look, the oceans are sloshing around over rocks, and rocks are pronouncedly alkaline, therefore the oceans are pronouncedly alkaline and there's never been much in the way of acidification in recent times because all the CO2 that used to be knocking around has ended up being fixed into rocks like dolomite, which was formed 750 million years ago, when there was much more CO2 in the atmosphere than there is now, and we might talk about that later in this presentation. But I don't see any reason why we should worry too much about ocean acidification on those figures, but I acknowledge that I'm not the expert here. This is a field in which uh, I hesitate 
to say too much. So what I am going to do is just to look at what the scientific literature is saying. And just as Professor Abraham chose various papers from the other side of the scientific literature, I'm going to choose papers from the less alarmed side of the literature, just to show that there are two sides to the literature, because I think it's the job of a professor, if he is attacking a layman for talking about a subject like this, to be exceptionally careful, to be honest. And you do not, Professor Abraham, only quote papers that suit your point of view without admitting that particularly in the literature on ocean so-called acidification, and of course we're talking about a slight movement towards neutrality at worst, there is an extensive literature that suggests that the problem may not be anything like as much of a big deal and a big problem as you called it. Let me just give you a few examples. Marubini and Thake. 1999, and they say that the pre-existing dissolved inorganic carbon content of the ocean limits coral growth, and that limitation is actually exacerbated by nitrate and ammonium, which we put into the oceans through runoff into rivers from fertilizers on agricultural land, and adding dissolved inorganic carbon as we should if we could increase the atmospheric concentration of CO2, would increase coral calcification rates and confer protection against nutrient enrichment from these fertilizers. So here is a paper actually saying that adding CO2 would increase coral calcification rates, the precise opposite of the papers that, he, that uh, the professor has cited. And then Rebusel, 2004. Observations show that coccolithophorids and other CO2-sensitive taxa should benefit from the present increase in atmospheric CO2. Iglesias Rodriguez et al., 2008, confirmed those findings experimentally and conclude that coccolithophores, which account for one-third of all marine calcium carbonate pr production, and calcium carbonate is chalk, basically. That's what forms shells. These coccolithophores flourish and calcify much more efficiently at higher CO2 levels. Vogt et al., 2008, they experimented with atmospheric concentrations of CO2 up to three times today's concentration, and they found that ecosystem composition, bacterial and phytoplankton abundances and productivity, grazing rates and total grazer abundance and reproduction were not significantly affected by CO2-induced effects. And then uh, Richardson and Gibbons, 2008, reported that in the North Sea there were no observed declines in the abundance of calcifiers with declining pH, that's moving towards um, neutrality, and that the role of pH in structuring zooplankton communities in the North Sea and further afield is at present tenuous. Well, I could go on. There's plenty more of these papers. But that just goes to show that when one is talking about these issues, it isn't appropriate only to give one side of the story, particularly in an environment where you're attacking somebody else for a point of view that disagrees with your own. When you start going into a personal attack, then it is your academic obligation to be balanced and measured and give both sides of the story. If you don't do that, then you're no professor, professor.